Hi. Hi. Um, well, thank you, Susan, for the, the very kind introduction and, and, to the, and to the why for having us back uh, and to all of you for being here and to uh, Maggie for writing this tremendous book. It was a real, real pleasure uh, to read it and I think it will be for, uh, for all of you uh, as well. It's hard to know where to start uh, with a book of this scale because there have been, as you know, an awful lot of Trump books but not one like this. Uh, I think it's the first book since he became president that really delves into the origin story uh, here in New York and takes us up through the present. And so I just wanted to start by asking you, you know, you covered him in New York before the presidency was a twinkle in his eye, or maybe shortly after the presidency was a twinkle in his <laughs> eye, as you report in the book. Um, what surprised you? What did you not already know about his formative years in New York that you uncovered in writing this book? Well, first of all, thank you for doing this. Thank you for reading the book. Thank you all for being here, and thanks to the Y for hosting this. Um, one of the things that I tried doing with this book was looking at how much of the, the world that shaped Trump, and, and then his unique character traits and his family, but the world that shaped him in New York, uh, how much those lessons informed what the White House looked like and how much he exported to Washington. A big piece of that, and we saw it over and over again in Washington, was how he wooed prosecutors. And it was in some ways right in front of us uh, in 2016. We knew that he had given donations to various attorneys general who may or may not have been looking at the Trump University issue. But it went back even further. And the relationship that was really key for him was with Bob Morgenthau, the Manhattan district attorney and someone many of you I'm sure are very familiar with. Um, he became friends with Morgenthau. He considered him a friend. And they developed this relationship that was partly transactional, but not entirely transactional. Morgenthau went to Mar-a-Lago at some point to visit Trump. Uh, Morgenthau's widow has told people that they were invited to Trump's yacht. Uh, Trump did a fundraiser for Morgenthau for his final campaign. And you could see the seeds. Uh, one, it surprised me the relationship these two had. Morgenthau would joke to people that Morgenthau's pet charity, the Police Athletic League, was the only one that Trump actually fulfilled his obligations to. Um, and so Morgenthau was certainly aware of Trump's reputation. Um, Morgenthau's office, according to my reporting, uh, only got you know one or maybe a couple of complaints from contractors who had been stiffed by Trump, who was notorious for stiffing contractors. They didn't consider themselves in the collections business. But I found it a pretty interesting window into how Trump handled problems. And when I spoke to people who worked for Trump, they said it was very clear that Trump considered Morgenthau his guy. Now, whether Morgenthau saw it that way is a different issue, but that's how Trump saw it. Well, but that's an interesting pattern that you see over and over again, right? And, and, and you get into this in the book. You know, one of the uh, attorneys general uh, who he donated to, who may or may not have been investigating Trump University, is now the vice president uh, of the United States, right? That's and when right. people get sort of called to account years later for taking Trump's money while, they, while he was under uh, some kind of prosecutorial microscope, there is always that kind of you know, a, a hand washing exercise, right? That of course I would never allow my decisions to be mm -hmm. influenced by something mm -hmm. like that. But it sounds like you have maybe some suspicions that uh, things are not always quite that clean. Uh, I think that in, in the case of how Trump views it, I think that Trump views these relationships with prosecutors, th these ongoing engagements as a way to end trouble before it spirals out of control. Now, I think elected officials look at it as, I'm getting a campaign donation. You know, I mean, in, in the case of Cy Vance, for instance, whose office began these prosecutions into the Trump organization before he left office, he took a campaign donation from Trump and then he returned it when it became controversial. Trump, over time, even before Morgenthau, started trying to engage with prosecutors. After Morgenthau, he would engage with prosecutors. One prosecutor, he's, who, you know, and soon to be statewide official he engaged with was Chris Christie when he was a prosecutor in New Jersey. Uh, Trump looks at this, I think, just very differently and it explains why when, for instance, Robert Mueller, the special prosecutor, a uh, special counsel, excuse me, in the White House was looking into a possible conspiracy between Russian officials and the Trump campaign in 2016, Trump's Im immediate instinct was, I'm gonna go talk to him. And I think that you, you saw that, I will go deal with this attitude a lot. 
How much do you think, from Trump's perspective, this is part of a deliberate strategy to, you know, pay your protection money up front versus, you know, he gets to know, he tries to get to know everybody, and that it, it can't hurt if you just know powerful people in some more generic sense. It's hard to tell, and I think there are, both of those things are present. I think that. Uh, over time in New York City, he developed a habit of donating to politicians because he felt they, they could be useful at some point. He was, uh, once upon a time, much more generous with his donations than he came to be uh, later in life. Um, you know, he is somebody who thinks that, you know, he, A, he collects people, and B, he tends to think that people could be useful someday. Uh, in the case of Morgenthau, uh, in the case of Giuliani, when he started sort of trying to court Giuliani in, in 1988 when Giuliani was considering running for mayor, that seems like it's less accidental. I want to be careful in how I ask this question because of, uh, you know, we're in, in Manhattan in the heart of uh, his native city. Um, there's this narrative here in New York, right, uh, and we're both native New Yorkers, that the city's always detested the guy, and he's always been kind of an embarrassment to New York, and elites here rejected him, and it's the rejection of New York's elites that you know, feeds this kind of anger that, that drives him. Um, your book is pretty compelling at pulling on that thread, but also in showing ways in which New York's elite uh, really did not reject him. There, is, there are a group of elites in New York who like to tell themselves, and I actually got an email from one of them yesterday, um, <laughs> uh, who try to tell themselves that the elites were always dismissive of Donald Trump. Nobody wanted anything to do with him. You know, I'm, I'm basically quoting this email. People didn't take him seriously. They, they found him vulgar and crude. And yeah, there were elites who viewed him that way, but there were also elites who, whether it was because their wives liked Ivana Trump or because they were just simply amused by Trump or they found him to be entertaining company, did not act that way with him. And, and it's, it's not that small a group. It would surprise people. I mean, one of the things that I write about is that Trump spent a fair amount of his adulthood in New York City sort of unable to decide what he wanted from the elites of New York. You know, at one point he got invited to join the Real Estate Board of New York uh, by, by the person leading it, and Trump's response was, I'm not a joiner. So there is an example of he's getting invited and he's not interested, and yet he can't stand the idea that he's somehow being looked down on and wants to be accepted. But there was, there was more elite acceptance of him than you would guess based on reading Spy Magazine or reading some of the coverage in real time. Can you just uh, uh, go a little bit further on, among the people who did accept him, how useful was that for him socially, uh, financially, politically? Uh, and to the extent that you can address this in a diplomatic way or not, uh, <laughs> is there something that, that uh, joins together the elites who were actually basically fine with Trump and as opposed to the ones who weren't? It's a really good question, and I'm trying to think of how to answer that delicately. I mean, I think that, at minimum, they were people who uh, did not have a bright red line when it came to certain of his behaviors, right? I mean, a lot of these people who were hanging out with him, this was around the time of the Central Park Five case, uh, if not after, it was pretty soon before. Uh, that was when he made his most you know, racially incendiary public remarks uh, in the form of calling for the death penalty for these teenagers. Um, there were people for whom he was entertaining or they got some form of, you know, something from dealing with him, whether it was, you know, access to him because it, it, it helped their coverage or what have you. But it was generally speaking, Alex, a precursor to what we saw with Republicans in Washington, which is it was people who needed something from him or found something useful to them. And so they tolerated parts of him that they would, I think, if called out on it later, would condemn. If, if more people had shunned him after the Central Park Five, if that had been a place where the city's civic leaders were really willing to draw uh, a red line, do you think that could have been the end of Donald Trump as a public figure? Actually, I don't, uh, and I don't because I think that uh, one of the things that I, I, I talk about in the book is uh, there was not widespread condemnation of what Donald Trump was saying among the populace in New York, and there is this, New York has this sense of itself as this, this avatar for progressivism, and there are parts of it that are like that, but there are also parts of it that are not, and uh, 
there are more of them than people want to acknowledge, and more, more, more sections of the city like that than people want to acknowledge. And he was not widely condemned. I mean, one of the things that I found when I was looking at clips of reaction to Trump's uh, full page ad calling for the death penalty, there was a, a letter, now granted this was somebody in Long Island, right outside of Queens, but somebody who wrote a letter to Newsday saying that you know they loved what Trump had said. They thought this was great. Um, I don't think that that letter writer was alone. And so I think even if elected officials had done it, other people across the city weren't willing to. And one of Trump's strengths is he'll always find someone mm -hmm. who is willing to tolerate or accept him or partner with him or what have you. It is just sort of a remarkable, uh, you know, preserved and amber moment of a time when the media and entertainment culture is really different than it is today, right? Where hard to imagine somebody uh, paying for an ad like that today and then a couple years later being in a Pizza Hut commercial. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, his ability to, uh, number one, compartmentalize his life and really have one piece of it here, one piece of it there, uh, has been pretty remarkable. Uh, but yes, there was... There was very little that he was doing in real time that was earning him, you know, he was getting condemned, but then the day would start anew. Right. Um, who do you think got him rightist earliest? That is such a good question. I think Wayne Barrett got him rightist earliest. Um, Wayne Barrett was writing for the Village Voice. He was told by Jack Newfield, who was one of my uh, professional rabbis at the New York Post when I started there, um, that he ought to he ought to look at Trump and, and not treat him like a clown. He, he should take him seriously as somebody who was trying to be a power broker in New York City, just as his father was, and that is what Wayne did. And Wayne, Wayne uh, was a tremendous thorn in Trump's side for a very, very long time. You mentioned uh, his father. The book is pretty searing in characterizing the manipulative, emotionally abusive environment that he grew up in. Do you have a sense of which elements of his father's behavior towards him uh, like really left the deepest mark? All of them. I mean, I, I think that Donald Trump's relationship with his father is, uh, and I got asked this question actually by an interviewer today who made a great point, which is that with you know, so-called strong men, uh, it always comes back to a relationship with their father, and, and this is no exception. A lot of weak men too. And then, <laughs> Um, he, his, he admired his father, revered his father, resented his father, feared his father. All of those things were there. And so I think all of the, the things that a parent would do to instill those emotions in their child are what left the mark. I mean, if you had to go to what is the rosebud moment, Fred Trump is the rosebud moment. Where does the fear come from? It's, Fred Trump was described you know, alternately as emotionally undermining, uh, just constantly undermining, even though in public he would always praise Trump, his, his son, always. Um, but it very undermining behind the scenes, um, very strict, very stern. Uh, Ivana Trump in her memoir described Fred Trump as a brutal father. Uh, and people can read into that whatever they want. Um, but people fearing him did not appear to be something that bothered him. There is a, uh, you know, you trace in the book the way his resentment of, his perception of being excluded by the elite, the sort of swells in, in Manhattan, and how that shapes his you know, fairly curdled view of the world. What do you think it is about him? There are a lot of people who achieve elite acceptance, you know, not immediately in life, right, who are not driven by anger and rage and resentment of having taken 25 years to achieve, you know, broad professional uh, success. What is it about him that you think makes that such an important um, a source of just uh, pain, resentment, motivation? The, how long it's taken him to be accepted? or the No, what do you think? I, what I'm saying is there are people who take 20, 30, 40 sure. years to achieve elite acceptance uh, and don't have it come to define them oh, that they resent how long it took. Uh, and it does seem to define him in a different way. And what do you think that is about him? Well, it's funny because I would argue that actually the presidency is probably the height of elite acceptance, to some, or at least the elite entree in the country, and that still didn't make him happy. So I'm actually not sure that there was ever an attainable level for him. Um, but what I think framed this so early for him is just this constant sense, and I think this was forged by a couple of things, Alex. One is 
when his father was investigated by federal officials and by state officials over loans that he had taken or loan programs that he had been part of for his uh, housing projects um, or his building projects, there was this real scarring sense on the family, according to everyone I spoke to, that you know the, the same government that could be a source of help to you can take everything away. And I think that that instilled in him some constant sense of grievance, this is ours, this is mine. Where it's hard to separate it from with Trump is the flip side of what you're asking is a sense of entitlement. And at the end of the day, he is the son of a wealthy man who grew up in a wealthy home where he was, you know, according to neighbors, when it was raining out, driven along his paper route. So, you know, sometimes these things just boil down to the simplest explanation. And somebody who acts like they deserve a lot is because they were always taught that things were going to be hardwired for them. There is an extraordinary moment in one of your conversations with him that speaks to the point you just made, when he, where he says to you that you, know, you ask him, was the presidency worth it? And he says, you know, the way I see it, playing my friends, I don't have the verbatim, but playing my friends have money and nobody knows who nobody they knows are. Nobody knows who they are. Yeah. You got it pretty close. Yeah. Um, at what point in his life does fame and celebrity become such a, a consuming obsession? Pretty early. Uh, you know, he had talked about, and, and he was open about this, how he had thought about going to USC film school, uh, which was never a real option for him. But wanting to be a star was always something that he wanted. And he's talked about this too in interviews, that he you know, brought show business to the real estate business. Um, I mean, that's certainly one way of putting it. His critics would put it a different way. But he, uh, but getting attention has always been a, a driving force for him. I think when it became a consuming force was in the mid 1980s when he was achieving some level of fame, and every time he got a taste of it, he just wanted more. And so there's this scene in the book where uh, he's being led through the Republican National Convention in New Orleans, uh, which he decides to attend at the last minute, and he's being He's being shepherded through by a man named Lawrence Gay, who later came to support him in his, in his campaign in 2016. But Lawrence Gay was an associate of Roger Stone, and Roger Stone was Trump's main political interlocutor at that point. And Trump at one point looks up and he sees the balloons and, and everything, you know, the netting up in the ceiling, and he starts murmuring to himself, this is what I want. And Gay can hear him, and that was what he wanted. Do you think he still sees the presidency that way today? As opposed to something that oversees the lives of millions of people? The most powerful office right? in the world? <laughs> <laughs> he definitely sees it as the most powerful office in the world, and I think he is certainly aware of losing that. Uh, I remember, and I'll never forget this, uh, asking a, a friend of his in 2017, does he like the job? And the friend said, oh, yeah, without missing a beat. And I said, what does he like about the job? And the friend said, Air Force One, Marine One. I mean, this was literally the answer. Um, you know, the, the main powers of the presidency never really seemed to, to interest him. The idea of having a, an easy authority interested him. It's why the pardon power interested him so much. It was something that he didn't have to go through Congress. It was something that he didn't have to debate endlessly with aides. He could just do it. It was ultimately up to him, even if it was against what the pardon attorney would recommend and there, were, you know, there was a process. He could bypass it with fewer problems. And that, would, that was ultimately what he thought the office was going to be like. So certainly the power. But the attention is a really big piece of it. Uh, you know, the, the only person who I can think of who has a, a similar level of need is Bill Clinton in terms of just wanting attention that way. And the only reason that I, I mention him, and it's not at all the same in the sense that Bill Clinton doesn't you know, engineer news articles about himself. Bill Clinton just wants attention all the time. I remember colleagues going to the house in Chappaqua right after Bill and Hillary Clinton had moved there uh, when she had just won the Senate race. And uh, these, these are reporters. And Bill Clinton insisted on giving them a tour, and and, one, and it took like two hours. And one of them said, one of them said something like, "I, I could have literally been the gardener," and I, and he was just dragging me around. There is there is an element. There's an he's got an element of what Trump has, but what Trump has is just on a fundamentally different scale. 
I mean, if, I feel like from reading the book that that's how Trump was when he was the president of the United States, right? <laughs> yes. It wasn't in the post-presidential. <laughs> it was both. Combat, right? Yeah. No, Trump. It was. It was very much that he loved giving tours. He would. He would, you know, drag people around the Lincoln bedroom, and he would share facts that sometimes were right and sometimes were wrong that he had sort of picked up from um, from the staff. Uh, he he loves playing host. Um, one of the the anecdotes in the book. Uh, that I remember, I still remember. I heard about this. It was it was last year. Was that he was uh, driving? There's a bridge that leads to Mar-a-Lago. Okay, there's a there's a waterway um, between where Mar-a-Lago is and where the rest of Palm Beach is. And often, supporters of his would stand on that bridge as the motorcade was driving to Mar-a-Lago. And at one point, he invited a bunch of them to the club, and and the the staff was like. What are we supposed to do with this? You know, other than fiddle what he wanted, because you don't say no to the president. But they also had the sense that it wasn't just that he was looking for attention from his supporters, but that he was turning those supporters into a show of something for his paying club members at Mar-a-Lago. And so it's a show, just, show of what? A show of look how popular I am. Look at look at look at what I can do. You know, it was sort of entertaining for them. It represented a potential security threat, less for the president, who you know was always going to be away from people to a different degree, but for the people screening these attendees outside, it was potentially risky for them. Because they could have been armed. Because or... they could have been armed. Because they could, you know, they could have they could have had ill intent, and it was the people protecting the president who would be in jeopardy, less so the president. What do you think? What do you think power means to him? That is an excellent question. The ability to do whatever he wants when he wants. I honestly believe that is what power means to him. And does that mean just being able to act as an individual with impunity, or is there an element of being able to do whatever he wants to other people? I think it's both. I mean, one, I, I would, I, what I would point to to support that is just that what we saw with him as president was, and, and Jeff Berman, the former uh, US attorney for the Southern District of New York, writes about this in his book, that it, it's not just, and I really urge you all to read it, it's a great book, uh, and one of the best of the Trump era. It isn't just that he wanted to use the Justice Department to protect himself, like he did after the election in 2020, but he wanted to use the Justice Department to go after other people, uh, you know, I, and his enemies. I write about how when he found out that Comey was not getting charged after he you know, berated Bill Barr about this in the summer of 2019, he, he picked up a remote control for the television that he insists he doesn't watch very often um, in the dining room off the Oval Office, and he took it and he threw it at a credenza. And that's another theme that comes up in the book a lot is him throwing things. Um, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not something that he never does. When there was testimony from Cassidy Hutchinson, the former White House aide, during one of the January 6th hearings, she testified that he had thrown a cheeseburger at the wall. Uh, and that she had helped clean it up. I don't know if the, the details of what she testified to about herself are, are, are correct, I, but I do know there was some incident where he threw something, and it sounded very familiar to me based on the reporting I had done for the book. I'm trying to uh, keep a straight face uh, on the follow-up question here. <laughs> Is the throwing stuff... <laughs> where are you going with this, Alex? <laughs> no, is, it, I, there's a, I, there's a, is the throwing stuff a sort of moment of losing control and having a tantrum and, and, and just lashing out? Or is there an element of, uh, is it a way of asserting his own impunity and asserting his own power in the situation? I think it depends on the moment, honestly. And I think one of the things that's really difficult for people to understand him is, is figuring out what the motive is in certain, in certain moments. It can ch the, the same action can be different mm -hmm. in different settings. So for instance, and, and I had reporting that, that came too late to, to put in the book, but that he, he had this incident when he was president where he didn't like uh, uh, the hotel where he was staying in Israel, and in, he didn't want to sign the guest book, and he took the pen that he had been given and he threw it across the room. Um, that seemed more like just being angry um, as opposed to asserting dominance. The remote control seemed more like asserting dominance. At what point in his life does the just relentless lying start? <laughs> well, um, I don't know if I can say when it starts. 
but I certainly know that when he was, when he and his father and their company were sued by the Justice Department in 1973, in October of that year, which is how he connects to Roy Cohn, ultimately, um, Trump told different stories about how he had found out about the lawsuit. And I think he, he claimed in one interview that he had heard about it on the radio. And in fact, he had been served. Um, so I can date it. I can date it back to the month I was born, um, and, and, and I'm turning 50 next year. Um, so, you know, it's been going on, you know, a long time. His, his father, um, you know, we've all written and read stories about Trump using pseudonyms. John Barron, John Miller, you've all heard tapes and so forth of him doing it. His father would use a pseudonym, Harry Green, but he would do it, he told people, to try to keep contractors honest that if they knew his name, uh, they would not, they would charge him more. They would charge Fred Trump more. There's a logic to that, right? It's just that it also involves saying that you're somebody who you're not. Um, I think Trump picked up a lot, on a lot of these tricks very early. It's, I mean, this is not an original observation by any means, but he just lies about the biggest things and the smallest things, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the, I mean, you alluded to it before, the claiming he doesn't watch television. Obviously, he constantly watches television, mm -hmm. right? Um, do you have any, and, I, and I, I'm sorry if this is asking you to sort of quantify something that can't really be quantified, but like, do you have any sort of just rule of thumb on like, how much he's lying for a purpose versus how much he's lying because that's just what he does? That's what he does. It falls in the same category of, you know, Sometimes it's just what he does, and sometimes it's to get out of something. I mean, often it is to get out of something. So in, in one of my interviews with him, I asked him, and the television issue came up in this question, I asked him what he had been doing during the riot on January 6th, which at that point was still a source of mystery, even though we had all been told he was watching television, but I wanted to hear him from him. Um, and he said, I wasn't watching television. I'm paraphrasing, but it was, I wasn't watching television. Uh, I found out about it on the late side. I was having meetings. I was with Mark Meadows. I mean, we know from the House Select Committee testimony at the public hearing documenting that that's just not true. But I think his immediate reaction at me asking this was to go to a quick lie. Now, was the quick lie because he didn't really want to say what he was doing on January 6th? Or was it that he's super sensitive about people talking about him watching television, to your point? I don't know what the what But the like, why are. in an interview with you does he, I, I mean, this is a great, great moment where uh, he claims that actually that, that uh, march across Lafayette Square to uh, yes. the church, uh, actually that was Mark Milley's, Mark Milley's idea, idea all along. He I suggested think, we walk together. I yeah. think you write in the book that you just like straight up laughed at that point, yes. right? Yes. Uh, like, why? <laughs> I, I, when I, when I, when I, sort of interjected when he said that. He said, well, I said this was his idea. And he said, well, let's say it was equal or something to that effect. Um, because it is just how he is more comfortable, it seems. And I, I don't know why that is. But for whatever reason, it, it just gets him from point A to point B faster. And generally, that, that is his goal, is just to get from point A to point B. Something that's really remarkable, uh, the book, is a catalog of just, uh, it is among many other things, a catalog of just his incredible capacity for vulgarity. Uh, Thank you for including the among many other among things. Many other things. I'd like you all to read it, so. Uh, <laughs> no, the vulgarity is incredible, and it's all the more incredible because you actually don't see that from him in public, right? That you don't see him getting up at the microphone with very, very few exceptions, just like swearing and yep. uh, saying gross stuff about, uh, you know, people in the audience or whatever. Um, it does seem like he has the capacity to toggle on and off a pretty core personality trait like that. He does. I mean, one of the things about him, and you just hit on, I think, a really important point about him, he has the ability to toggle on and off on a number of fronts. I mean, so one of the things, and I, I talked with one of uh, the, the a writer for the Times, David Lanhart, about this uh, for a piece that went up today. But one of the things about interviewing him is that he can be very hard to pin down because he's kind of all over the place. And yet, there are often lines that he's really aware of and doesn't cross. And to your point on vulgarity, you know, there was that moment in New Hampshire where he called Ted Cruz the P word, although from, from stage, it wasn't like it was just a random thing. Um, but, you know, that kind of thing is few and far between. In public, in private, he is 
extremely vulgar. Um, it often seems like he's trying to shock. And this was not material I went hunting for. You know, people I was interviewing kept volunteering anecdotes like this. And I left so much bluntly out because at a certain point, then the whole book becomes that. And that's not what I wanted to write. But, but it is a part of who he is. I think not a surprise that Donald Trump talks about sex in a gross way uh, in private, right? We've all heard uh, the access he's, he's Hollywood he, tape. He's on Howard Stern. Yeah, right. right. Um, I guess I was struck in the book by how much he seems to talk about men having sex with men in private and uh, homosexuality in general in like pretty graphic terms. Um, what is that about? There's a pretty deep thread of homophobia that comes up with him over and over again in in various threads of reporting that I did going back to the AIDS era, uh, and possibly going back longer, but at least just in terms of what I was able to report on, it was it goes back to the AIDS era where, you know, he looked to these various hyper-masculine icons, George Steinbrenner, for instance, um, uh, as models for himself in, a, in an era where a lot of men were very homophobic uh, because, you know, people were panicked about, about AIDS. But he took it to a, a different level. Um, you know, he would, he would call reporters and ask if, you know, is so-and-so gay? I just shook hands with him. Um, now, that's the kind of thing he continued years later. Um, you know, he, he, went to, uh, he went to visit when he was having his, uh, during some of his personal financial uh, troubles, he went to visit uh, some, I think it was a banker, who, who was suffering, uh, it was in the hospital, and either the banker or, I only can't remember this because I've been up since 4 a.m., but the, uh, the banker uh, uh, or whoever was in the hospital with him was an AIDS patient, and Trump shook hands with the person and then rushed to the sink to wash his hands. And so, um, you know, there is a, there is a thread of that. Uh, a former consultant who worked with him told me on the record that uh, a, a gay executive who worked for Trump, openly gay, uh, had a partner who's now the, the man's husband, that Trump was very accepting to that person to his face. Behind his back, Trump would call him a queer, according to the former consultant. And so it seems to have something to do with his view of strength. Um, you know, it, 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 is, it is all wrapped up in his view of, of manhood um, uh, and weakness and not weakness. Uh, but, but that's as best as I can explain it. He, he said this thing, one of the things he does too is he, he says the same thing like 10 years later, almost identically. And so, you know, one is a story that he started telling me, this doesn't relate to, to homophobia, but he started telling me a story in one of our interviews about how, you know, he said, before I did the presidency, like it was like a show, um, <laughs> and before, before I did the presidency, but I was, and I was famous and rich, and I had all these friends who were rich but not famous, and, you know, they would call me and they would say, you know, Don, I can't get a table at, Joe's Stone Crab in Miami, can you help me out? The lines, are, and so, and this is this apocryphal, you know, restaurant. Um, he told like an identical story to Lois Romano at the Washington Post in, I think, 1984, about how, you know, I am able to get her table in a restaurant because they reckon, I, I don't have to worry about reservations. Um, on the Howard Stern show, at one point when he was talking about Tiger Woods and Tiger Woods' affair that, busted up, and I guess it was affairs, that busted up his marriage. Trump starts musing about how, can't we agree he's definitely not gay? Um, another staffer who worked for Trump in the White House, or worked for Trump on the campaign in 2016, who very publicly had an extramarital affair, when that guy came to the White House and is in the Oval Office with Mike Pence, Trump starts talking about how, you know, sometimes you find out someone is, uh, uh, you know, gay down the road, and you're not surprised. You know, this guy's not even a little bit gay. There's just a, a sort of a, a continuity in how he talks, um, but it is it is it is a frequent theme. And and someone in his world messaged me last night and said, "How did you?" Because there was also there's also an anecdote from the campaign during debate prep where he says something that I'm not going to repeat about trans people. And you can read the book if you want to know what it is. But, um, but, it's, but it's really vulgar. And this person who used to work for him texted me last night and said, how did you pick up, this was their words, how did you pick up on his transphobia? And I said, I, you know, A, I think he's kind of public about it at this point. But B, I heard about it 
this, in, this incident, and I just kind of started talking to more people, it's, it's pretty present. A lot of these things with him are pretty present. His aides just don't really talk about it. I mean, there's the element of it that's clearly uh, you know, uh, bigotry or a sort of visceral aversion, right? Um, but then there are also anecdotes in the book where he's engaging in, I think, what he would probably call like locker room talk mm -hmm. uh, about gay sex in a way that I think we've never heard Trump do in public, right? There's a, mm -hmm. a scene near the end of the book where he's commenting on, um, tell me if I'm getting this not quite right, where he's commenting on the physique of somebody who's visiting the White House or somebody who's going to be- A golf partner. That's who you're thinking of, uh, I think, right? Well, there's, a, there's a, uh, an aide in the room who, who he knows to be gay and says, well, yeah. that guy could, you know, he could throw you around and make you forget your husband. Yeah, that's right? what he said. It was a golf partner. Yeah. Um, it, there is a, there is a, the number of people I talked to who described him using the same two words, who know him over time, one was nihilist, one was voyeurist. And a lot of that conversation seems to fall in the latter category. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk a little bit about, because uh, uh, I'm mindful of the clock here, uh, the people around Trump. Uh, one of my favorite uh, anecdotes in this book, and it's a competitive category, uh, is Jared Kushner early on in the Trump presidency calling up uh, the congressional leadership and saying that he's, you know, he's done some thinking, he's done some uh, research, and it sure seems like the system of leg legislative committees that you have is pretty inefficient. Uh, <laughs> I think that we should reconsider that. We need to change that. Yeah. Um, and it's just, I mean, it's funny because it's just so naive and so ignorant, right? But um, like, was, how much was that characteristic of the knowledge base of the people immediately around Trump when he came into office, and how different is their knowledge base today? So I think you have to put it in two different buckets, and one is the, inst the Washington institutionalists who worked for him, and, and there were a number of them, or just people who, you know, believed in government, understood government, um, you know, had worked in big business. I'd put Gary Cohn from Goldman Sachs in that category. Um, Dina Powell, who also worked at Goldman Sachs, had worked in the Bush administration. So there are people who, who knew the way things worked. Um, then there are people who were pure Trumpists, like his family members, um, you know, or like a couple of people who worked around him who had never been part of a campaign before, let alone a government. And they started out with a, a pretty steep learning curve. Now, I would say that Jared Kushner actually learned a lot. Uh, you know, he was one of the few people who figured out how to navigate certain systems in that government. But that was not how it began in 2017. And, and when you have a president who only trusts his family, but his family also doesn't really know a whole lot, um, that creates problems. Only trusts his family, but also sometimes considers firing them not to their family. Well, to a point, I mean, I, everybody's only trustworthy to a point, Alex. Um, look, when in 2017, when, uh, when he was talking about firing Jared Kushner, and then by definition, his, his daughter would leave too, uh, and he, he would express sympathy for his daughter to people. It's a little perplexing to me that this is, this is the thing he's seizing on to attack about the book because it's probably the thing that was the most reported pieces of it uh, in 2017. Uh, but it was all, not all, but it was partly in, in relation to the fact that Jared Kushner was getting a lot of negative press attention in relation to the Mueller investigation. Um, and Trump is never really good at one-on-one -on -one interpersonal conflict. So after all sorts of discussions about how they were going to leave, he then eventually kept asking John Kelly and Don McGahn, the White House counsel, if they would, you should facilitate this. And they essentially said, thanks, but no, because uh, you're not gonna back us when, when your family members balk. And that was an accurate read of the situation. I wanna get to these questions from the audience in just a minute, and I wanna remind our, uh, uh, the folks who are watching online that you can submit questions as well. Um, I do want to ask you a little bit about a couple topics that are in the news right now um, that are very, very relevant to the book. Uh, in the last couple days, Trump came out and called for an end to the war in Ukraine and sort of volunteered his uh, services to negotiate uh, an end to the thing. I was wondering if you were going to get to this. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yes, that's the, I think, a reasonable response to uh, uh, that development. What is going on uh, that triggers that kind of uh, response on his part? The war's been, you know, it's most of the year now at this point, right? He's not sort of uh, uh, spoken up in that way before. He's uh, said a number of totally unserious things about the war and sort of admiring uh, Putin's uh, cleverness and the whole thing uh, early on. Um, why now? And I'm sorry to go there uh, just because it's such a, a, a well-trodden path, but like, 
you get into, into this in the book, uh, the origins of his sort of apparent fascination with Russia, and what do you feel like you came away uh, with that you didn't have going in? So let me start uh, backwards. The, uh, what I came away with that I didn't have going in was just the, the extent to which he had been kicking around building in Russia much longer than I had realized. I knew that there had been some effort in the mid-90s. Um, I knew that he had taken a trip there and there was some loose proposal by a, a travel uh, authority in Russia to him. But he had, he had more extensive conversations about it than I realized. I spoke to people who were at dinners with Russians with whom Trump wanted to build. Um, these were people who worked with Trump. Um, uh, and, and he was trying to find a way to make projects happen. You know, the origins of the fascination, I don't feel like I got to. I'm not quite sure what planted this seed in his head. Uh, I do know that in the late, oh, sorry, excuse me, in the mid 1980s, around 1984, and this actually also answers your second question, Roy Cohn starts telling people that Trump wants to offer himself up as Reagan's arms negotiator with the Soviet Union. And one of the people he suggests this to is Lois Romano at the Washington Post, who doesn't take this particularly seriously, but thinks, hey, this could be an interesting style section piece, which <laughs> also gets back to how Trump sort of furthers himself in news coverage. Um, but it's not clear to me whether it was because it was something that was a, way, a press stunt to get attention, and then he started to take it seriously as an idea, and then got more fascinated with the Soviet Union, or if there was something deeper. But he was serious about building in Russia for a very long time and sort of fascinated by the place. Uh, but I see him offering to be the, the Ukraine war negotiator as a similar thing to that 1984 offer. Something that you uh, address a number of times in the book, and I found this really interesting and honestly surprising, is you describe how hard he seemed to take it when American troops were killed under his watch. Can you just describe a little bit more what was it that the people around him saw in his reaction that told them uh, this is hitting him hard? And why do you think that's the thing? You know, a guy who sort of hand waves away a child separation and a police brutality and all kinds of other uh, cruelty. Why do you think that's the thing that uh, registers in, in that way? I think a couple of things. I think number one, I think that there are a few things that are more associated both with American military, American war, any war, frankly, uh, and also the acts of a president than signing a killed in action letter. And so I think it is just something that is easy to understand. It has a certain, it's really hard to divorce it uh, from this with him, but a, a certain cinematic quality, right? The president is signing the letter. Uh, and then there's the part that he didn't want to have to own this. And, and, and that was real for him. The number of officials who made clear to me that he didn't believe in these wars and, and he was, pretty clear about that and what he said I, I, throughout the presidency, although he also then increased troops in Afghanistan or kept them at the same levels and so forth. Um, but he didn't believe in it. Uh, he wanted to find a way out, and he didn't want to attach his name to it. You know, the attaching his name to it thing is a really big piece. And so the way he would communicate that was really that way. I don't want to sign this, not another one. It just, it was, it was different than other things. Just a first question from the audience here. Um, Start with an easy one. Why did he keep the documents uh, after he left? Oh, okay. Uh, the presidency? Well, we can just answer that and call it a day. No, but, um, but like w the the questioner asks: Is it trophies? Is it souvenirs? Is there another purpose for them? Is that is there is it is it knowable at this point? It's not knowable at this point. I think the 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 possibilities are all of the above. I mean, trophies have often been what I have come back to in discussing this, just as one of the hundreds of people who have been given the the. Trump Tower office tour, where you go to his corner office on the 26th floor, and here's Shaquille O'Neal's shoe, and you know, here's this framed thing that Scott Walker sent him. I think it was a picture of the two of them. And he's got these trinkets um, that he shows off, and so he likes trophies, but he also likes leverage, and he tends to view almost everything in terms of leverage. And I don't know whether he thought that these documents would in some way give him leverage, or if not returning them would give him leverage. I can't rule that out either. And I don't think we're going to know for a very long time, if ever, why he did it. I'm sorry. 
What's something that you admire about Donald Trump or what's something that you think he has done right at any point in his life? That's a really interesting question. Is that yours or is that from No. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I think he did right. I, I think that, uh, I mean, this is tough because I don't want to take a position on policy, sure. right? And so uh, that's not really a question that we that we answer. Uh, look, I, this answer actually will probably not thrill some people, but um, he, he did work very hard in the 2016 election and in ways that we were sort of not seeing. He was not smart about policy. He was not smart about you know, uh, 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 getting knowledgeable on issues. But just in terms of getting around physically around the country and going places toward the end of the campaign, he did do that right um, when, when his opponent was not doing that uh, at certain points. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think I'm in a position to adjudicate what policy he got right versus what he didn't. Sure. Um, I'm going to ask you this question. I think you'll see this coming a mile away. Uh, in fact, you asked me the same question, I think, six months ago to the day. Um, how do you navigate writing a book about the most powerful person or a very powerful person whose decisions impact Americans and their democracy and not immediately reporting everything you know? Um, so this question has, has come up, I think, with, with every book that has been published um, related to Donald Trump and even before that. I think it came up when Woodward and Bernstein published The Final Days um, many decades ago. I was looking to paint a fuller picture of Donald Trump, and that takes time. And that's a process of going back and interviewing sources again and visiting scenes again and often learning new information as I'm doing it. When I have something that is uh, significant and confirmed and reportable, my goal is always to get it into print. Uh, but, but books are just something different. And there was one person who I knew had talked for a lot of books during the presidency. And I asked this person a couple years ago, you know, why did, why did you tell this to book writer X when you wouldn't tell me that for the paper? And this person said, because the books are not immediate. They don't come out tomorrow. They, they're out in the future and I don't really have to think about it. And there, that was an interesting thing to hear and that does inform how a lot of people think about this. In terms of exactly that point you just made about just really wanting to refine these uh, scenes and these moments and get them uh, totally right, can you talk about, and this is my question, not on the card, uh, can you talk about how much harder that is when you're dealing with a subject who lies constantly? Uh, it, it's incredibly hard, uh, and it's incredibly hard for two reasons. One, because uh, that person is not a reliable narrator, uh, but it also, a lot of people around him take that as license to be less reliable narrators too, because they must be more credible because he's not credible. And that is a problem. So we sort of saw over the course of four years of that presidency, a lot of myth-making by the people around him about what they were doing. Now there are officials who did stop a lot of things. There are officials who kept things from happening. It's clear that by the time we got to the final year of the presidency uh, that Donald Trump was running his own show in a way he had not been for the first two years. Uh, but some of that was just the product of him sort of having a sense of how far he could take certain things by then. Uh, but I do think that uh, it, the fact that he is so uh, willing to say things that are not true gave a bunch of people a sense that they could say things that people might be likelier to believe. And I think the onus is on all of us to try harder to get it right. It made getting the, the best attainable version of the truth harder throughout the presidency. Uh, it certainly was complicated for the book. How much do you think that's just gonna be a feature of our politics now, that he's opened the door to, you know, if he's basically normalized everything short of being as big a liar as Donald Trump? I don't, I don't know that I would put it quite that way, but I, I do think that there are a lot of people who, certainly a lot of people in the Republican Party, but not only the Republican Party, who think that it is okay to do X, Y, Z because Trump. And that shouldn't be the, the answer. Uh, it shouldn't be that you can do something 
because you're not doing it to the same level he is, uh, and therefore it's okay that you're doing it. I think that we have seen politicians uh, finding it okay to, or believing that it's okay to lie, um, their spokespeople thinking it's okay to lie, in ways that I don't remember being this pervasive before. Um, there's a question in here just asking you to characterize your uh, reporting and writing process in general, and I, I want to invite you to answer that broadly. Uh, I'd also like to ask you just to elaborate a little bit further on what you just said, and how much do you feel like you ended up having to leave out of the book because at the end of the day, you're just dealing with a bunch of really unreliable narrators? A lot. I mean, there, were, there, were, there was a lot of reporting that I left on the cutting room floor because uh, you know, it either felt like fan fiction dialogue or it felt like uh, you know, I, I couldn't get a second source on it, or, um, or it wasn't clearly just some person's remembrances where it was clearly attached to them. Uh, it was a huge challenge. Was he personally helpful on any matters of fact? Yes, when I asked him, would you, still, would you be facing the same legal problems in Manhattan if Bob Morgenthau was in office? And his answer was that Bob Morgenthau was a friend of his and Bob Morgenthau would not have stood for this. That was enormously helpful because there's nobody else who actually could tell me that Donald Trump really had that view, but he could. I could do like another 90 minutes with you on, on Bob Morgenthau, <laughs> and I'm going to uh, limit myself to just one follow-up question. Uh, like you reported on him yourself mm -hmm. uh, when he was uh, DA. I suspect that virtually everyone in this room voted for him uh, at some point or another. Uh, how Probably. much does that surprise you? That Trump considered him a friend or that Morgenthau seemed to go along with some of it? Both. That Trump considered him a friend did not surprise me because Trump often considers people a friend when they're not journalists. Um, you know, Mitch McConnell. Um, I mean, like, I can go down the list. Um, I, that Morgenthau was receptive to him was very surprising to me. Um, very surprising to me. And that Morgenthau would have, got, have gone to Mar-a-Lago it's especially interesting because I found out from somebody who was close to Morgenthau that Morgenthau didn't like to fly. That he had, I think he had, a, he had an ear issue where flying was problematic for him. Uh, I was surprised by that. I was surprised that by 2005, when Donald Trump has been in bankruptcy several times, and there are all kinds of complaints about him in terms of not paying bills and so forth, that Morgenthau would have a fundraiser at Trump's apartment and Trump is giving a speech for modern thought. Um, you know, and then of course, even that relationship doesn't, despite what Trump said to me, it doesn't matter because when John Katzimatidis kept pushing the grocery store magnet, who I'm sure you've all shopped in his stores at some point or another, um, kept pushing Trump as president to give Morgenthau the Medal of Freedom, Trump wouldn't do it, posthumously, but Trump wouldn't do it. Why not? It wasn't clear. I think he was just sour and angry. He was angry that he was being prosecuted or investigated by Morgenthau's successor. He just wasn't in the mood, but. Um, someone else who maintained uh, open diplomatic relations with Trump longer than I think you might, not you, but one, one. might uh, uh, expect was Bill Clinton. You report in the book that Clinton was talking to him even after Trump started his presidential candidacy uh, in 2016. How long did that go on? What was Bill Clinton up to? It didn't go on very long. It, it lasted through, I think, when, when Trump was in, a, in either a proto-candidacy or soon after he began his candidacy in 2015. Uh, what I think it was about was Bill Clinton seeing a reflection of himself in Donald Trump. Because what he told Donald Trump was, you know, you're really tapping into you know, a, a certain anxiety you know, uh, among certain voters. Uh, and it was clearly white, white working class voters. Um, and I think that Bill Clinton loves being in the mix and loves being in the game. And I can't begin to imagine why he was talking to one of his wife's opponents at that point, but that's a whole other issue. There is, there is one interesting Bill Clinton and Donald Trump anecdote um, that isn't in the book and that has been reported before, but it really got overlooked because so much stuff was happening. And I think about it a lot, which was that Bill Clinton gave this interview right after Donald Trump won the election in 2016 in November. Uh, I think he gave it actually in early December to a local Westchester paper and he talked about Trump getting angry white men, that was the term, to vote for him. But then he tells this story about how Trump calls him the day after the election and acted as if nothing had happened, as if Trump had not just savaged you know, 
Bill Clinton's wife over the course of months and really tried to humiliate her over and over again. Um, and that is Trump. He will punch you and then he will come back and say, but I didn't knock your teeth out, you know, so therefore it wasn't really that bad. Um, and it was just a really interesting moment. There's a, a, a moment in the book where someone who's known him for a long time tells you that, you know, as he's sort of rising in the political world, uh, he has gotten crazier. Yes. Um, do you think that's, A, do you think that's true? Uh, and B, do you think that that affects the dynamic that you just described, the sort of reset every day, every relationship? Um, do you think he's more vengeful now than he used to be? I think he's quicker to anger than he used to be. Um, I, you know, I don't know, I, I guess the corollary is that he becomes more vengeful, but he is definitely quicker to anger. Um, uh, there is a bitterness about him. Um, it used to just be grief, and I, I know that's gonna sound like a distinction without a difference, but it used to be sort of just grievance, but he was playing to a crowd. And now there's just a real sense of bitterness and, and anger a lot of the time. Do you think it's because he lost the election? I do, and I think it's because uh, he has been rejected at you know, various points. I think it's because he's under investigation in various places. I just think there is a, um, there is a sense that, that he has that he should be living a different life and being treated differently than he is. What do you think that life looks like? That he's been, I think back to something, and this is in the book, that something someone told, who worked for him told me shortly after uh, one of the surgical strikes, I think against Syria in 2017, that he had thought the job was going to be, you know, um, decision, action, praise. And I think that he believes he did the job, why is he not getting praised? I mean, that is just generally. So I'll give you a for instance. I asked him, uh, for those of you who either have the book or are getting the book, there's a series of a PDF of a bunch of responses he gave me in Sharpie um, to fact check questions I asked. And one of my questions was about why he pushed through with the criminal justice reform why he, Bill, why he signed it, since he clearly doesn't favor it and has been second guessing it almost ever since. And he said something to the effect of, did it for African Americans, got zero credit. And it was a really pure distillation. It is, where is my credit? Why am I not getting my credit? Um, so I think, I think that's it. Do you think he knows he lost the election? <laughs> that's such a good question. I think he did know at one point. I'm not sure he does now. It's really hard to tell. Um, you said uh, in an interview over the weekend that you think he's kind of backed himself into a corner where he has mm -hmm. to run for president again. Mm -hmm. Do you think that calculus would be different if he had gotten the sort of post-presidential treatment that everybody else gets, right? Where if, you know, if uh, he was invited to, uh, uh, you know, do a Netflix documentary on America's national parks and, uh, you know, uh, asked to go to the Queen's funeral uh, and, and all that. Uh, do you think that that would kind of fill whatever uh, hole inside him is, is clearly there? No, because it's never, it's never filled. Uh, you know, it is, it gets filled. Sometimes of your options there, your, you know, A through C or whatever, you know, the Queen's funeral seems like the one that would have really made him very happy. Um, but, and it's funny, you know, people around him kept saying to me, the queen, the queen really liked him. And I was like, did she tell you that? I mean, I don't, it's, you know, the queen did not really like him. And there, were, there was all kinds of tension between Buckingham Palace staff and the Trump staff during that state visit, um, which is its own story. Uh, but even if he got that, it's never enough. I mean, I, I, I had a conversation um, with a, I'm not gonna name this person, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna sound like Trump. I'm, I'm gonna tell a, a story about someone you're all, you're all gonna think, you're, 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 yes, you're all gonna think this person is imaginary, but it's actually a real person. But um, an athlete who really doesn't like him and who, but who interacted with him a bunch over the years. And I had a conversation with this person uh, last year and the person said, I really thought being president was going to make him happy, but it didn't. And that's, that's a pretty simple but clear, true point, which is 
you know, I understand that what he would say is, I was under investigation, Mueller, he would point to, you know, all of these things. But at the end of the day, he started looking for a fight about his crowd size right after he got inaugurated. So, you know, he's most comfortable fighting. There is never going to be something that fills him up. Do you think it is possible for him to be happy? Um, I don't mean happy in a sort of like, I just took this great photo with Don King kind of way, but like in a, a more durable, meaningful way. I feel like now, now I am turning into the psychiatrist, which I've been trying to avoid because I reject it. But um, no, I don't think he's particularly capable of happiness the way other people identify it. I mean, I, I said earlier that people who worked for him in various contexts use the word nihilist to describe him. Um, nihilists aren't usually very happy. Um, we're really almost out of time, but uh, you mentioned the queen. I guess I mentioned the queen. You mentioned And then the you queen. elaborated on the queen. <laughs> uh, but just to stick with the queen. Um, <laughs> he's clearly fascinated with the royal family yes. going back a long ways, right? Um, can you just expand on that? It's his mom. I mean, his mom, and he would talk about this. His mother would watch the, you know, the pomp around the royal family. She would watch it on television. Uh, I think he came to associate it with a certain type of glamour. Um, I think you can't really ignore the fact that it's, it's royalty, right? I mean, I think that's a big piece of it, is that it's, it's a level of power and prestige, and, and um, uh, I mean, it's literally the throne. So I think that that's part of what captures it. But also, I can't divorce it from the fact that, you know, the royals are huge tabloid fodder, and he's a huge tabloid guy. So. Um, you take a whole lot of heat for what you do uh, for a living. I do. Uh, right. Uh, look, as your friend, as your colleague, uh, I feel like you have done more to tell the American people the truth of who this guy uh, is and what his presidency was than any other uh, active reporter. Thank you. But I want to ask you on a, on a personal level, and there's a, there's a question in the cards uh, about this. Given what your personal experience of performing that public service has been, do you feel like it was worth it? Yes. It's what we do. And, uh, you know, um, this isn't compulsory work. No one's forcing me to, <laughs> to be a journalist. Um, you know, I always think about something that... Uh, that a colleague, Bob Hart, who's now at New York One, used to say to me when we were at the New York Post, I mean, I, what we are doing is, is very important. We're not curing cancer. We're not, I'm not fighting in a war. I'm not Doctors Without Borders, right? I don't, I don't, um, but I do think what we do is incredibly important. And I would do it again. I feel very privileged that I got to do it during this period in history. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you to all of you. The book is Confidence Man. It is on sale outside. And just a reminder to uh, scan that QR code and give some enthusiastically positive feedback on your experience uh, this evening. Thank you.